Tonight, let's turn to uh, Hebrews chapter 12. I'll preach uh, tonight on what I call the greatest verse in the Bible. This may not be the greatest verse in the Bible. Maybe you've got a favorite, and I'm sure very few people would select this one as the greatest verse with all the verses there are in the Bible. But to me, this is the greatest verse because this verse here, at least for this age, tells you the danger that you're going to encounter as a child of God and how to, and how to cure it. In this verse is found the main problem with 20th century Christendom and the solution for the problem. And the verse says, uh, Consider him, consider him, Hebrews 12, 3, Consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied faint in your mind. That verse doesn't look like much. That verse has a lot in it. And that verse says, Consider him. That's the cure for what we're going to talk about that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye, that's you, lest ye be wearied and faint in your mind. And that's the big danger today. The danger with Christians today in America, and uh, like I, I don't wish to talk as a fool, speak uh, boastfully, but by the time you've been in this thing for almost a half a century and been at about, oh, uh, 600 churches or something, you know something about Christians. Now, there are many things I know nothing about at all. Uh, I, you never heard me undertake to expound on mechanics or carpentry, and you never will. And you never heard me get up and give a talk on uh, banking and checking and astronomy and physics and that kind of stuff. I leave that stuff alone because I know where I'm stupid and better keep my mouth shut. But there's something you know something about. Uh, I know nothing about farming, very little at all. Uh, I know nothing about mechanics. If I if if I have a, a toaster breakdown, I can't fix it. If I have a, a, a lawnmower breakdown, I can't fix it. If my car stops, I sell it. <laughs> I mean, it might, it might just be out of gas, but I, I don't think about them motors. I open that motor up and they say the carburetor. Yeah, sure, the carburetor. What in the world is the carburetor, man? I mean, I, when it comes to an automobile, I'm just like a woman, you know. Something goes wrong with the car and I lift up the hood and I say, there's the trouble right there. <laughs> Somewhere in that, under that hood. <laughs> It might just be out of gas, but there's some things I know nothing about, but I know Christians. And I've observed something through the years going up and down this country, and I observe it more and more all the time. What I observe is all along the way, Christians are getting weary and they quit it. They're getting weary and they get worn out and they quit. You start to read your Bible through. You don't read it through. You start to tithe. You tithe for a while to get in debt, and then you quit tithing. You start coming to prayer meeting, you got to mind for your mind. Maybe if your mind gone up, you're not going to miss prayer meeting anymore. You don't miss it for about six months. Then you miss it for about two months, and every other month, but it's ain't there anymore. And the thing is, what Americans lack like these days, and I'm American Christians specifically I'm talking about, is they have nobody to stick to a thing. They can't stick. I believe the old-time uh, people, I believe they call it stick to itiveness. I think that's the word. And that isn't the, that isn't the dictionary word, but that's a good Bible word. It isn't in the scripture, but it's scriptural. Uh, stick to it. Stay with it. And the God's people don't stick to it, and they don't stay with it. And the reason why is they get worn out. The devil's big uh, thing these days is to wear out the saints. I read a passage back there in the book of Daniel, and it says he'll seek to wear out the saints. And some of you Christians, you're going to heaven, that's for sure. You're born again, you're saved, and all this and that. But when you find a dime go home to heaven, as you go, the devil's going to smile and say, well, I had a lot of fun out of him while he was here. <laughs> Just wearing you out. And so I'm going to talk about this text here tonight. And the text says, consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. And then he says, you have not yet uh, uh, striven uh, to, to, the, to re the shedding of blood in resisting sin. And that means you may have had it rough. But you haven't had the roughest Christ had it. You haven't got to Gethsemane yet for your shedding blood and coming out of you like great big drops of sweat. You haven't got along in there yet. And so he says uh, in the pastures, he says, Consider him, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Now, first of all, we're going to talk about the things that are going to cause you to faint. We talk about things that are going to cause you to faint. We're going to talk, uh, first of all, about fleshy service. And fleshy service means nothing in the world will tire you out any quicker than trying to serve God in the flesh. Uh, the, the Christ says one time, he says, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Flesh is weak, and you go in the power of your own strength, the power of your own flesh. You're not going to last very long. 
Christians try to serve God in the energy and the strength of the flesh. It can't be done. Uh, you, can't, you can't do what you want to do in the service of God. prayer life and don't spend time in that book. And you can't do it if you're going to trust yourself. If you're going to trust your self-sufficiency and your own power as a person and your background, your education, your ability to work and this and that, you'll get worn out real quick. Didn't you ever wonder why in the old days how it was? Isn't it peculiar in the old days they'd have these meetings, these meetings would be eight and nine weeks long and people be there every night with their families? And sometimes them women had 10, 11, 12 kids. Eight weeks at a time sitting right. Well, you ladies couldn't handle that. You're down to three-day meetings, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday night. When I first began to preach, nearly all the meetings were two-week meetings. And some of them were just one-week meetings. And once or twice every year down south in Alabama and Georgia, I had three-week meetings. The meeting went on three weeks. But you people, you couldn't. You couldn't run three weeks coming every night. Just beat you to death. And the thing is, you get weary. When you get weary, you faint in your mind. Now, first thing you talk about is this fleshy service. What does that mean? Well, the flesh is expendable. The flesh is weak. The flesh, uh, the flesh wears out. Darwin was wrong. According to Darwin, you're getting better and better and stronger and younger every day. But you're not. You're wearing out. Uh, I don't see anybody with a used car could believe in evolution. <laughs> Your car out there in the parking lot is not gradually getting better and better. It's gradually falling apart. And you're falling apart. Now, you don't like to be reminded of that. That's what is known as the power of negative thinking I talked to you about this morning. But the fact is you are, and the fact is uh, the old gray Mary when she used to be. I mean, I don't kid myself. I, when I'm playing hockey with the boys sometime about down there, we play in, in 85 and 90 degrees, you know. And boy, I'm down there after about an hour and a half of that thing, play 15-minute games. And after an hour and a half of that thing, some of those guys, 20 and 25, are just ready to drop, man. They're ready to drop. I'm back there yelling, saying, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go, face off, face off, face off. These guys are <laughs> right around here. I tell them, oh, to be 50 again, man, oh, to be 50 again. I'm rubbing it in, you know. They get to be about 25, they get dragging, I say, okay, boys, hup, hup, trip for, you know, double time. But I'm not kidding myself. I mean, I can't handle what I can handle at 50. I can't handle what I can even handle back at 60. Uh, you take these plane rides I get on now. By the time I've been cooped up in that plane three hours, boy, I am ready to scream, man. And in a car, I couldn't take, I don't believe, more than four hours in a car anymore. Four hours that do me in. And I know it was back when I was 40, back when I was 30. I'm here driving all night and all day and all night and all day, driving, you know, 18, 19 hours at a stretch. But the old gray Mary ain't what she used to be. I mean, I, I don't kid myself about it. Anytime, anytime I want to think I'm still in condition, I get on the hospital and try to run up about four flights of stairs. And let me tell you something, ladies. A little makeup can do a lot to help your age, but you can't fool a flight of stairs. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, anytime, anytime you think you're really getting younger, just walk up about eight flights. You know, about, about, with about 10 in each step, about 80 steps. You see how it goes. I mean, something, something in you tells you that uh, getting near the evening, you know, and that, that flesh will wear out. It won't sustain you. You have to keep putting uh, stuff into it. And spiritually, you have to keep putting the Word of God in prayer in it or it's going to give in on you. It's, uh, life is filled with entropy. You folks that have houses know that entropy is a long way of saying things fall apart. But uh, you take, uh, you, you take, uh, you know, the, about 10 years ago, we had a bunch of hippies. They were telling us how to straighten out this world. And one woman said, my son's going to straighten out this world. He can't even straighten out his own room. <laughs> now, how's he going to straighten out the world? I mean, one woman, she hung a sign in her teenage boy's doorway and it said, in case of an atomic attack, bomb this room first. <laughs> and the same way with the cars, they wear out. I saw a cartoon one time of a guy coming back to a, he's coming back to a, uh, a used car, a lot where he bought his used car, and he come there, that thing puffing and steaming and, you know, and banging and clanking away and nuts and bolts all over the place and come that place, come back in that uh, used car lot about one piece at a time coming in there. And as he comes in, he says, the salesman, he said, would you please tell me again what a wonderful car this is? It gets awful discouraging at times. <laughs> Down there we had a tow bridge going across Pensacola Bay, you know, 25 cents. One old rattletrap came down there and he said, how much is it? And the guy said, 25 cents. And he said, sold. 
Now what that means is in the natural world with the flesh and everything, it wears out. And you folks have houses, you know how that goes. I mean, I just wish I could have my own house, live in my own house. Well, okay, that's fine, me too, and that kind of thing. But a house is a liability, and something more is going wrong with it. You take, I watch people get up in years, and they get up in years and have a nice piece of land, a nice house, and when they get up really in years, get all by themselves, nine out of ten of them sell out and go down there tamp and bomb a trailer. Move in a trailer down there. They don't want to take care of the yard. They don't take care of all the stuff that breaks down. They don't want to be alone out here when the, they want any neighbors nearby to help them, you know, that kind of thing. It wears out. I've had in my time, I, when I came down to Pensacola, Florida years ago, I came down there with a used car and uh, a used trailer, uh, uh, kind of a U-Haul trailer. I came with a used car and a used trailer at 40, at 40 years old, and thinking that was about the end of things. And before I got through there, I had a church, two churches and a school and a boat and two houses and four automobiles before I got through down there. And I want to tell you something, the more stuff you get, it's like fly paper, you get stuck to it. And the flies and the fly paper saying, I've got him, I've got him, I've got him. <laughs> the fly paper's got you. Haven't you ever noticed the first thing a fellow does when he gets him a home worth about $300,000 is he buys him a Winnebago and a camper and gets out of it? You ever notice that? <laughs> I mean, as soon as the guy gets some money, he gets some fishing equipment, heads for the woods. The house, the screen doors begin to, they won't slam, then they get tear, and then the pump doesn't work, and then the air conditioning doesn't work. And then something else goes wrong. And then the commode doesn't work, and then it gets stopped up, and then the grease pit overflows. And then you have trouble with the sewage system and the water connection, and the, and the city won't do this, and the city won't do that, and all that kind of stuff. There's nothing in the world that will wear you out just like trying to serve God with the natural means. Because the natural means collapse. They fold up. Now I'll tell you something else about this matter. And I don't know a great deal about what I'm getting ready to say. I've had very little uh, exp uh, experience in this, but I know it's true. Sometime uh, persecution can go cause a, cause a Christian to get weary and, and quit. Sometimes just the devil working the Christian day after day after day and, and turning his relatives against him and turning his friends against him, turning the wife against him or turning her husband against her, you know, in case you're a woman, that kind of thing. Sometimes that can just wear you out and after you, while you say to yourself, oh, what's the use? What's the use? I mean, why serve God? It doesn't pay to serve God. I'll just quit. And you sit down and you just quit. That happens. Now, when it talks about, when we kept talking about persecution, I must confess I, I know very little bit about it. I've never been persecuted. I've often I've been introduced in certain places and the pastor get up there and say some very kind things about me and many times they know something about what I've been through and they say, well, I just thank God Brother Upton had enough grace to go on for God the way he did and I can't imagine what it's been like to go through what he's had to been go through and this and that. And I've always felt kind of bad when they get talking that way because frankly, I never felt like I've been through very much anything. I haven't got any persecution complex. You couldn't get me to get a persecution complex. You take it for, now if the Lord tarries, see, I know it can get rough. What I'm saying is I haven't had any yet. Now it may come. But people worry about being persecuted. I don't know much about it. I'm not an expert in that. I know some fellows who were, but I ain't one of them. And I've never had to put up with a great deal. I've been hauled to court about eight times, I think. And uh, I've had people threaten to bomb my school, and I've had them threaten to blow my head off and cut my head off with a butcher knife and a few other things like that, but it didn't come to anything. <laughs> you know, just talk, just talk. You take people these days, they get upset and people talk about them. Uh, Brother Rupp, do you know what so-and-so said about you, you know? Father said to me, he said, you know so-and-so? I said, yes. I said, he said, he just hates your guts. I said, good, isn't that wonderful? Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> isn't it wonderful to have some people you can count on, you know? <laughs> I mean, Murphy's Law, you know, friends come and go, but one good, one good enemy will last for a lifetime. That's Murphy's Law. And uh, besides, they keep, you, they keep you alert. That's good for you. Boy, to come that kind of thing, I know, I know very little bit about uh, persecution. I think people cuss me out, lie about me, and talk about me, and call me this, and call me that, and misrepresent me, misrepresent my teaching, and all this stuff. I don't consider that persecution. That's a little bit of trouble, but not talking about much. I mean, I've, I've known some fellows who were persecuted. You take Lester Roloff. Lester Roloff was persecuted. They persecuted that fellow. I think they're responsible for his death. I've talked about these things. I've talked with fellows who flew airplanes and things, and 
I've talked with uh, Cameron down there that came through a couple of years later by the school and talked to me about some things. And he asked me why I thought that the Lord took roll off home. Of course, everybody tried to figure it out. And uh, it's, it's so hard to figure out what God does sometimes, isn't it? I mean, why would God take home Lester Roll off and leave you Robert Tilden? <laughs> you imagine that? Why do you suppose God does things like that? <clears throat> I mean, God took home a friend of mine named Buddy Cargill. He's an iron worker up in uh, Baltimore, Maryland. One of the finest fellows you've ever met in your life. Rough, tough fellow, God saved, loving God. One of the sweetest Christian souls you've ever met in your life. And just about the time he got about 100 people together and got property for a new building right in the main highway in Baltimore, where he had access to Baltimore and Washington, D.C., Lord took him home. He wasn't 55 years old. Why'd God do that? Why'd God take him home and, and leave a swagger and baker? Oh, you can't understand God sometimes. I talked about this one time in a place. I said, uh, why in the world would God take a home blessed girl off? And I fell in the audience and said, because he wanted to see him. <laughs> I guess that's about as good as anything you can get. But I mean, you can't, I can't imagine why God would do a thing like that and take, open, take home a man like, uh, like uh, roll off and leave you uh, 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 Jimmy Baker. I mean, Baker, I mean, my God, people, I hope, I hope nobody up here ever gave him a quarter. I hope I'm not looking right now in the face of somebody who sent that money. I hope to God I'm not. I mean, I don't guess I'd be in a Bible church, but you never can tell these days. I mean, how could you think that was a minister? How is that, that fist smile? He, 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 <laughs> how could you look at that and think that was a minister? How could you do that? <laughs> we have a joke down south. We say they took off Tammy Baker's makeup and found Jimmy Hoffa. <laughs> That's a joke down there. But you take, you, take, you take Jimmy Baker. He's in prison now. They put him in a prison, threw him in a cell with two queers. He never there two faggots. This queer's a $3 bill, man. He's happy as a dead pig in the sun, man. He don't care. <laughs> and folks say, well, they ought to put him in jail for, I don't think they ought to put him in jail. I think they ought to put you in jail for giving him money. I think people who gave him money should be guilty of corrupting a minor. That's what I think. <laughs> but when you try to explain why does God do things like that, I don't know why he does things like that, but he does things like that. And we come to these things here along about uh, uh, temptation and, and persecution and things. I know a little bit about temptation, but very little about persecution. Very little about, I know some guys that did. Roll off, you know, you know Lester roll off. Uh, he was flying up there at 19,000 feet in a Cessna that had no business being that high. And he was flying that by to get over a Thunderhead. And he had a pressurized cabin. He got up there, one of them, one of them currents up there that, Come at about 150, 200 miles an hour, just broke off the wings, and down he went. And I said to Cameron, I said, of course, when I talked Cameron first, I said, well, I think God took Lester Roll of home, because I think that if he lived to see what they did with his work down there, the government did, he'd have probably gotten a shooting war and done something real bad and probably killed somebody. And I believe he would have. And I wouldn't have blamed him if he had of, either. But anyway, I said, I, uh, he said, well, he said, was up there 19,000 feet. I said, what was he doing up there 19,000 feet uh, in a plane with a little plane like that? Didn't he have a big one? And uh, Cameron said, yeah, he had a big one, but it cost too much money to run it. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, brother, up in that great big plane he had, he told me how much it was. I forget how much it was, how much it cost to run gasoline in that thing, fuel for that thing. And he said, with all the money he'd played in, paid in court costs fighting this law thing, he couldn't afford to take it up. They just drained that fellow of money through the courts till he couldn't afford to take the right plane, then he got killed. Now, I'll tell you something else. I've talked with Jack Chick out in California. I've known him for years. And Jack Chick, he gets a lot of static. And I, I, I'll admit he does some wild things, you know. And, and Jack Chick is a reporter. He's not a statistician or a, he's not a, a scholar. He's a reporter and he reports what he hears. And sometimes he reports some pretty wild stuff, you know. It's kind of a midnight inquire type of thing, you know. <laughs> And you take Jack Chick, sometimes he reports some stuff, it's way off base. He, when he was getting ready to put out his book in Sabotage, he wrote me and asked me for an estimate on Roman Catholics, how many Protestants they killed in the Dark Ages. And he had, a, uh, he had an estimation there from some Camelite preacher in a Camelite debate with a Catholic priest, where the Catholic priest himself uh, gave a figure of 50 million. And I wrote back Jack Chick and he said, I don't, I don't think that's too strong. 
I wouldn't make it 50 million. You're talking about a whole population, that thing right there. I, I'd say probably 5 million would be closer to it. But he went and published 50 million. And he published a fellow was named Johnny Todd one time and showed up. And Johnny Todd professed to be one of the grand witches, the 13 druids that ran the world, all this crap. Just nutty as a fruitcake. I mean, way out in left field. And, uh, and I, I wrote Brother Chick and told him about that, but he went ahead and printed his book. And uh, since then, the book has gone way down the sale, and that's been about the end of it. But that isn't Jack Chick's fault. Jack Chick does, he goes to the fellow for information. The guy gives him information, he prints information. And a lot of times he's right. For example, about, uh, must have been about 15 years ago, he put out a book on the charismatics, and he said right now the charismatics are planning and infiltrating Protestant works and getting professional whores into the youth department to wreck the pastor. And he said, especially among the charismatics. Baker, <laughs> Gorman, <laughs> Swagger, <laughs> he had them. He had them. By the time he put that thing out, Christianity Today said this stuff that Jack Chick is putting out is Christian pornography. Yeah, but it was right on the money, boy. Right on the money. He had them. He had them. He had them downright. And you take Jack Chick. I've been by his place out there in, uh, in uh, California, and I've seen the bullet holes through the wall. 45 bullets, man. 45 caliber bullets right through the wall where, he's, where they do the work. He put out a, check, a track on Queers called uh, The Gay Blade. And after he got that thing out, Queers come by and shoot through the wall. Uh, queers aren't gay. They're psychotic. You know, a fruit in your life was just as nervous and high strung and unstable as a, as a 60 year old with St. Vitus dance and, and some other things. <laughs> you take uh, the greatest individual killers in this age are all Bill Clinton's buddies. Idi Amin, 200,000. Carell, uh, Houston, 32. Charlie Manson, seven of them. Son of Sam, 12 of them. They're all faggots. Jim Jones, 900 of them. Old Jim is just as queer as Rock Hudson or Liberace. I don't know what you know about queers. I didn't know about a queer in my life who wasn't just as nervous and shook up and psychotic and neurotic as somebody about half out of their mind. They're not gay. I need the word for it. Now you take Jack Chick, they shot bullet holes through his window there. I tell you what else I've seen. I've been to the conversion center in, uh, in uh, Newark, New Jersey. It's around, well, it's near more Philadelphia than there. And in Philadelphia, out on the outskirts there, going out that way, I've seen, been there in uh, Alex Dunlap's conversion center. There's a different fellow running that now uh, than Alex Dunlap, but uh, that conversion center, I've seen the place there where the Catholics uh, set fire to the grass in the front yard, uh, dried grass in the fall and the leaves, long about uh, October and everything was getting brown, they set fire to the leaves out there in that yard and tried to burn up and burn down the conversion center. And he showed me piles of rocks, a shelf full of rocks that big, as big as baseballs and croquet balls pitched through his windows. Those fellas been persecuted. Now, I never had any of that. A lady phoned me up one time down in Pensacola, Florida, and she said, I know who you are, Peter Ruckman. I know where you are, Peter Ruckman. Your people have been passed out these tracks at St. Anne's Festival. You know, this hate literature against Catholic, and we're going to bomb your school. I said, I believe you. <laughs> she said, I'm not kidding. We're going to bomb it. I said, I believe you. Believe a word you're saying. She said, I'm not joking. We're going to bomb your school. I said, I believe you. I know you people. I said, I think you would. I think you'd kill your own grandmother for 25 cents. <laughs> Click. Down goes the phone, you know. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I've had a little of that, but, but not much, not much. I had a guy pull a forty-five on me one time after a meeting, but he didn't pull the trigger, so it don't make a difference. And I had a fellow one time, he pulled me up the telephone and said, you blankety blank, I'm going to come and cut your head off with a, uh, I'm going to cut your head off, put it in a garbage can, he said. And I said, well, you yellow-bellied, chicken-livered coward, you. <laughs> and he said, what? I said, the idea of you pulling a knife on an unarmed man. And he said, I wasn't thinking about a knife. I said, what you going to cut my head off with, honey? A pillow? <laughs> and down he goes. <laughs> but you take, uh, you take, I never really had it, but I know some got Carlin Popoff. That fellow was persecuted. He's persecuted. Carlin Popoff, that's one of the fewest fellows whose signature I'd want to get. I've only wanted the signature of two men in my life. Uh, 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 an autograph. Harlan Popoff and Pips Piller. 
I never got to Pips. He, he, he was a Luftwaffe pilot. He died before I could get his. But I got pop-offs. They make that pop-off stand up like this against the wall like this for two days and three nights. So his legs will swell up like an elephant's legs and he can't even see it every time they move. They kick him in the, hit him in the kidney. That little boy standing with three days growth of beard on him, stand up with his eyes, blood shot about half out of his mind. And finally he turns his head this far when the guard's half asleep, otherwise he get hit again. And he looks out the window there and the, sun, and the moon's coming down the snow at night forming a cross right out there in the snow. And Harlem Popoff looks out there and he says, God, why are they doing this to me? Why are they doing this to me? Why are they doing this to me? And the Lord says to Harlem, they're not doing it to you, old buddy. They're doing it to me. Uh-huh. That's persecution. Now, I know very little bit about that. Well, that's the cross bearing. That's where the cross comes in. And uh, it, sometime God take a Christian, just wear him out with it. I had a meeting one time up in... Uh, in uh, where was it? It was uh, uh, Baltimore, Maryland. There was a fellow up there, a Christian man that did a lot of witness in the plant where he worked, and he worked with a Catholic fellow. And the Catholic fellow was a godless, cussing fellow, cuss all the time, you know, and the machinery wouldn't work and slow down, get all jammed up, he'd cuss and cuss it and bang around, slam on it. And this Christian would say one, one time, he said, uh, why don't you pray and maybe you'll get better results with it instead of cussing. And that Catholic said, oh, you blankety blank fanatic, and went off in some place. And this Christian friend of mine, he's about 45 years old, went over to this piece of machinery that he'd been trying to fix that he couldn't get fixed. And he went over there and prayed, bowed his head over it and prayed over it. And he had it fixed in about three minutes. And he was just getting ready to look up from his work where he just had it fixed. And just time he got ready to look up, a tomato came right through there and hit him right in the side of the face. <laughs> And, he, and he, he started to wipe it off, and the Lord said, just let it run. Just let it run down your face, and don't look up. So when he got up from that machine, he just went right back to work and just let the tomato run right out on his face and drip down his overalls, on his coveralls, and didn't do anything about it. And boy, when the lunchtime came, everybody was buddy, and they're giving free meals, and a free ride home, all this and that, and that guy working the same table with him was fired. Now that fellow, they had a little touch of persecution. You know what I've seen? I've been in meetings where a Roman Catholic kids got saved and the nuns paid a visit to the homes, the mothers and daddies, who were mother and daddy of the kids, and came in there and cursed that family and then reached up there on the side of the, uh, of the wall on the, uh, up by the fireplace and took a picture of the Baptist pastor down off the fireplace and threw it in the fireplace and burned it right in front of the mom and daddy. You know what that means? They'd mean they'd burn the pastor if they could get him. And I'm not talking about Mexico. I'm talking about America in 1970. All right? If the devil can't get you through persecution, sometimes he tries something else. I mean, if the devil can't get you one way, he'll work on you another way. But his job is to wear out the saints. And we talk about these things. We mean that sometimes if the devil finds persecution won't do it. He finds you're tough and you can take it. Then he'll try something else. And the name of this gentleman down here is Temptation. I mean, if one thing doesn't work, then he'll try something else. And if the Christian is too hardy and too strong and too solid a Christian to yield to these kind of things, why, well, then he'll work on him another way. I've seen that. Down there in uh, Wing, Alabama, a little old town near South Alabama, near the border of Florida, we had a meeting down there one time, a real revival meeting, a three-week meeting. A lot of people got saved. And there's one girl who got saved there. She's about, oh, must have been about 14 years old. And she really got a dose of it. And she began to witness. She had an unsaved daddy who was a sot drunk. And when he found out she'd gotten saved and came home again to sing hymns, he whipped her. And the next Sunday she went to the church and he whipped her when she got back. He told her, he said, every, time, every Sunday you go to that black and black holiness church down there. It wasn't a holiness church, it was a Baptist church. When the Baptists, you know, really get going, they accuse them of being holinesses. And he said, every time you go to that holiness church down there, I'm going to whip you again. And boy, she kept right along. A 14 years old boy, and I mean, she's there every Sunday and took her whip when she got home and singing hymns around the house. Now, while that old man had all that he could stand, and after about five or six weeks of that, he called her in, and her name was Lillian. And he said, Lillian, he said, uh, I'll tell you what, honey, he said, you're just driving daddy crazy, all this religious fanaticism, this nonsense. And he said, I'm sorry I, I whipped you, and I didn't mean to hurt you like that. And he said, I'm not going to do that anymore, but you're just driving daddy crazy. I'll tell you what I'll do, honey. I'll tell you what I'll do. He said, your next birthday, I wasn't going to do it, but I'll buy you a car. 
your next birthday, and we'll, we'll let you we'll put your hours. You don't have to be in at 9 o'clock at night, but let's just stay out until 12 o'clock. And if you met that girl a year after daddy gave her that proposition, you couldn't tell whether she's a Christian or not. If the devil can't wear you out one way, he'll wear you out another. And if the cross won't get you, then he'll tempt you to quit and put temptation in front of you. Uh, the Bible says, uh, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. When you get saved, the first thing you better learn is don't stick your neck out and take chances you don't have to take. Did you used to fool with pornographic literature before you were saved? Uh, when you go in the magazine rack and look at the magazine, stay away from the part that's got those magazines in it. And you know where it is. Now, I would have struggled to be in the back. But if they got them up front, you know where they are. Well, don't go by and look at them. Get the stuff out of your head. But you can't see unless you've got images in your head to think with, and you can't get in your head to think with unless you've seen them. And if you don't see them with a boob tube, you're going to see them in the magazines. So if that's what the trouble you had before you were saved, don't go back and tempt the devil to let the fire get going again. There's a passage in the Bible that says, one place says, says, he said to Joshua, he said, uh, and the devil there in Zechariah 3, is not this a, bra a, br a brand plucked from the burning? You know what that means? That means there's a certain type of people who get saved, and they're men, and they get saved late in life, around 30 or 40 or sometimes 50. You know what they're like? They're like brands plucked out of the burning because they just about made it to hell, and when God saves them, the scorch, their, their, their coattails are still sin, boy, and they're scorching when they come out. Well, it's like that. And if that's your case, then don't get back near the fire. Because you take this ember, this brand, pull it out of the burning, you see, and then if you leave it around the fire, it'll spark up and produce a little catch again. Now, I'm not saying you lose your salvation, but you'll be like that vine in John 15 that men gather and burn in the fire. In the fire. You see what that is? That's charcoal. <laughs> you know what charcoal is? It's a brand plucked from the burning. It just about caught fire permanently. It was burnt pretty bad. So don't go back near it. One time a man who used to have a lot of trouble with whiskey, I was talking to his friends about it, and he said, Oh, I got it whipped, man. I got it whipped. I got it down. I ain't had a drink now for five years. They said, Well, how do you do it? He said, I just do it by willpower. It's got my mind made up. I'm not going to do it, and I got enough willpower, and I just don't do it. And he said, to prove to myself I got enough willpower every morning, I just get up and guard a little whiskey and then spit it out before I start the day. <laughs> you know what happened? One day somebody slapped him on the back in the bathroom and he swallowed a cup full of it. He'd been on the bottle ever since. Don't tempt God. Don't stick your neck out. If you don't have to stick your neck out, don't stick your neck out. Don't take chances. You don't have to take. First thing you know, the devil will, if he finds a tempt that persecution won't do it, then he'll try temptation on you. We had a young lady who came to our school one time down there, and she did real well. I'm going to marry a preacher and go to the on just far and doing good in her studies and everything. And her dad was a medical doctor. He couldn't stand her being going out there. He said, what do you go out to that fanatical church for where those Ruckmanites hang, hang out? That's only good for a certain class of people, you know, that kind of stuff. And she kept right on going, getting the blessing. And finally he said to her, he said, uh, Kathy, I'll tell you what I'll do. He said, I'll tell you what I'll do. If you just go to Pensacola Junior College instead of going on that PBI, Daddy will get your car and buy a nice apartment over here in this place of now off the school. And you can have your own friends in and, you know. And Daddy fixed her. She wound up, she wound up marrying a rock and roll drummer, and she's had hell on her family ever since. Something like 15 years, just on and off and on and off and on and off. And God knows where he is tonight. She don't know. People say to their boy or girl, oh, oh you're called to preach? Oh, yes, you're called. Well, honey, I'll tell you what we'll do. And I've had this happen in Minnesota several times and in, in uh, Wisconsin several times. If you go to a good Southern Baptist school, or sometimes they say if you go to BBC, or sometimes they say if you go to Bob Jones or Tennessee Temple, Daddy will pay your tuition the whole way. But if you go down with that heretical cult down there in Pensacola, we're not going to give you a dime. See? And if one thing don't do the business, the other does the business. I mean, the devil's method today is to wear out the saints. And if persecution won't do it, temptation will do it. 
He'll just work on you and work on you and work on you and work on you till you quit. And this generation, this generation is much more dangerous than my generation. My generation, I'm the old school, I guess you know that. When I was born, Harding was president. You know who Harding was? <laughs> He's the one before Coolidge. <laughs> <laughs> and our generation was taught you never quit anything you start you go to your dead and then get up and hit it one more lick we taught them the obstacle course you can't run, walk lieutenant I can't walk crawl they'd crawl, they'd stop crawling I'd say roll <laughs> guys in his vomit roll <laughs> I never said this, fellow. Maybe nobody ever did. We had a joke about it. If a guy broke his leg in the obstacle course, he was sitting there in the Marine. The gunner came by and said, okay, get moving, soldier. Or maggot, they call him. And he said, he said, I broke my leg, Sarge. I broke my leg. He said, okay, don't waste time. Do push-ups. <laughs> <laughs> now, that was the generation I was raised in. Old boy goes off the jump tower, you know, down to the Fort Betting School. He's been talking about quitting, you know, hadn't quit yet. And he keeps talking about it. And finally, he jumps off the tower, you know, those practice jumps. And he's not hitched up the harness. And he falls all the way to the bottom. <laughs> and he gets upset. If it gets any rougher, man, I'm going to quit. <laughs> but your generation, your generation, a lot of you was raised to quit every time. Don't you know why the divorce rate is one out of two? Don't you know why it is? Because the generation that keeps coming up has been taught when things get hard, quit. So they quit. I'll be when a fellow stand there and says, for better, for worse, till death you do part, that means for better or for worse is what it means. Now, I suppose you've married to somebody that don't mean that. Suppose you're married to somebody who says, well, yeah, I took the vow, but things have changed. <laughs> the vow took care of the change, folks. You take these young couples, they bust up and right and left because the first time they have a big squabble and disagree, they don't think for $25, they can fix the thing up, the whole thing just goes down the tube. You know, I've seen in my, my school every year, every year, some guy stand up by the pulpit and hate to take out that diploma and say, he may be 35 years old and say, I know this diploma doesn't mean much. And he's right, it doesn't. We're not credited or certified or nothing, we're never going to be. <laughs> But he says, I'm just so proud of this diploma because this is the first thing I ever started that I ever finished. You begin to cry. He'd be 35 years old. I've seen that every year for something like 28 years. Sometimes he's 25 or 20. Most time he's 35. I've seen him 42 years old. This is the first thing I ever finished, I ever started. And I've sat there just amazed. I said to myself, could that be? Could a fellow... 35 years old, say this is the first thing I ever started, I ever finished? Yeah, it could be. It could be. All right, temptation gets you weary and, uh, and, and faint. Now, you know what the next thing will get you to get you weary and cause you to faint? It's gloomy forebodings about the future. See this fellow looking uphill. He's seeing all the obstacles up there. He's thinking how far he's been and how far he has to go. And his eyes out there in the future and he's worrying about what's going to take place out there. Uh, you can, folks, with the way this world is going right now, you can worry yourself into an insane asylum worrying about the future. Somewhere you've got to get a hold of the present and start enjoying God now and living for God now and get your mind off the clouds and the horizon. Because there are too many of them. That Bible said, he that observes the clouds shall not sow and he that observes the, uh, the, the wind shall not reap. You can't be a farmer and just spend all your time looking up in the air. You've got to spend some time tilling and planting and plowing. Now, I think you ought to know about the future. I mean, I'm perfectly aware of the Bilderbergers and the CFR and the European Common Market. I'm perfectly aware of the bloody killer, the poop and that bunch and what they're doing, and the Federal Reserve Bank. I know what's going on the CFR and the Trilateral Commission. I've got all that stuff, but I can't waste time with it. You've got to spend your time trying to reach people for Christ and trying to get the Christian strong enough to witness for Christ is what you've got to do. You can't get obsessed with that stuff. Drive you crazy. One time John Wesley was walking along the country road with one of his friends and they came to a cow looking over a brick wall. And this fellow had been telling John Wesley his troubles and moaning and groaning and singing the blues for about four or five miles down the road. And John was getting pretty tired of it, but he wasn't saying anything. And I finally came to a cow, was looking over a, a brick wall there, 
And John suddenly interrupted this fellow in his soliloquy, feeling sorry for himself. And he said, why do you suppose that uh, cow is looking over that wall? And the man said, I don't know. And Wesley said, because he, sure, cause he can't see through it. <laughs> and sometimes <laughs> you can't see through your troubles. You have to look over them. The Bible says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finish of our faith. And most of you, and I know some of you got real troubles. I know that. I know that. I don't mean to speak down to you. But most Christians I've met, the ones that are doing the most griping, they got the least troubles. The ones that have the most trouble, they usually get through with the most cheerful. People get feeling sorry for themselves. I alone am left, and they seek my life, you know. I don't have persecution complex like that at all. God been so good to me. I sell John R. Rice's books. We got them out at the bookstore. We sell Curtis Hudson's books. I recommend people to go to Jack Hiles Pastor School. Nothing to me. I recommend two girls to go to Bob Jones last year. I got three boys to go to Pensacola Christian College. You think I'm prejudiced? You don't know what you're talking about. I've got more grace than 50 of these birds. You know why it is? Because the Lord has been so good to me. i just never been really kicked around like a lot of folks. <laughs> I'm one of the Lord's spoiled kids. I mean, I, I, get, I get too much out of life. I can't afford to hold a grudge against these people. If you're 71 years old and you can still jog three miles and do 2,000 with a jump rope and play hockey, you better shut your mouth. Amen? Amen, brother. Well, I'll shut it. <laughs> Let her go, man. And I, you take this thing about what's out here. I'm not going to get involved in it. You can't get involved in it. I haven't had any kind of trouble. I've got the best wife in the world. My, you know me brag about my wife. You never heard me do that, but I, I do it now. My, my wife has restored my faith in women, ladies. <laughs> I didn't think there were any, really, but I'm frank with you. <laughs> But you take, uh, I got me a good Christian wife, and I got me some fine Christian boys, teach them how to hunt and fish and play ball and stuff. My bills are all paid. My school is paid for. My church is paid for. I'm in good health. got money in the bank. What's the problem? <laughs> I haven't got any problem. People act like they have problems. I'll never forget one time I was down in a traffic court, and there were a lot of other things there besides traffic violations in that particular court. I don't know what kind of a court you call that, but there was some other something, the guy I remember one color fellow came up, he was charged for robbing a gas station. He came up to the judge and had his lawyer stand right next to him. He said, I want my rights, I want my rights, give me my rights. And the judge said, I'll give you your rights, 15 years, bop, <laughs> just like that. And I remember looking behind me, there was a guy sitting behind me, and he had old snaggle teeth, you know, and brown gums and tennis shoes on with the toes out and scabs on his face. And you know, somebody peeled him in a fight. And he had a breath that put a blister in a brick wall at 50 feet, man. <laughs> I mean, like he'd been drinking, you know, a uh, 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 bay rum or something. And he was sitting there at about three days' growth of beard and gray hair all tangled over his face. Must have been about 60 years old. <laughs> and the funniest thing, there was a woman up there in front with a judge and her adversary, and she had some argument with her neighbor about a dog and a cat and a chicken. And they were up there with two lawyers in front of this judge, and this woman was saying, but my little poopsie, I don't know if that was the chicken or cat or the dog or what it was, <laughs> He, he killed my little poopsie because he got me. He said, well, her chicken got in my yard and scratched up my... They were going like that. And in the middle of that thing, I turned and looked at that old bum. He looked at me and he said, some folks sure got the troubles, don't they? <laughs> I never will forget that. <laughs> I mean, he had no mother, no father, no brother, no sister, no job, no help. Probably sleep out in the street at night. This little poochie killed my chicken, you know. Some folks here got the trouble, don't they? <laughs> that, that's the trouble a lot of Christians these days. They're just feeling sorry for themselves. You ain't got anything real bad. I mean, I'm down in the hospital. I'm down in the hospital and meet a guy down who's got a kidney stone. They can't get it out. And it won't pass. And they can't dissolve it and they can't operate. You want that one? You want to work on that one tonight? I've seen them. I've been, in, I've been in this past the clinics. Little old boys and girls have their arms, their hands growing out their elbows. And their feet growing out their knees. And double cleft palate. What were you saying? I get worn out with Christians in America. The spoiled. You people, you all drove a car here tonight. I doubt if any of you walked. You say, what a car. Well, it's a car. It got you here. 
whining and griping about what about the future? I'll tell you what about the future. Prepare for the worst and hope for the best. Prepare for the worst and hope for the best. Get you some dehydrated food, get it laid back. Get you a Swiss water pump, it'll convert, you know, come old water into drinking water. They got them. And get all the ammo you can get. And you better get it for January. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, brother. That's right. I'm telling the truth, man. Gun control is being able to hit your target. <laughs> Amen, brother. Amen. Always worrying about what's going to take place in the future. It's just going to wear you out. Now, the one that really gets them, and this is what I'm going to draw over here. The one that really finishes them off is a lion over here. And the name of this line is Routine Duty. If you want to know what wears out most Christians these days, you know what it is? It's just keeping body and soul together. We're living in the great thing where everything is time-saving and labor-saving. Everybody just, they got so many time-saving and labor-saving devices, they're just worn out all the time. And uh, you, take, you, take, uh, you take you ladies, you know why you're bush and can't do nothing for four or five nights in a row? It's just the modern conveniences, what just destroys you. I mean, your washing machine broke down. You phone up for repair. Or do you have a Maytag or a General Electric or a Westinghouse? Oh, you go back and see what it is. We don't handle those. You'll have to phone Montgomery Ward. You phone Montgomery Ward. Oh, is that right? It broke down. Well, we'll get a man out there day after tomorrow. I got three loads of wash to wash. Well, I'm sorry we can't handle it. Well, do you have a warranty? You remember your warranty? Oh, all oh, that stuff. Drive you crazy. You have a warranty. Somebody slipped me a piece of paper. Then 10 years later, you got the piece of paper? <laughs> 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 and then you phone up, and then you phone up, finally the guy comes out there, looks at things, and says, oh, yeah, and the Johnson rod is loose in the standard plan, that'll cost you about $500, you know, and, and well, we have this piece in it, but there's a strike down there in Los Angeles, and the shippers, you know, and the, and the stevedores, and, and we won't be in for about four or five weeks. Now, by the time you're going through that stuff all day long, the telephone ringing, the TV banging, and the kids, you just bush, sister, you're worn out, you just beat. <laughs> You can't read any Bible. You can't any pray. You just whip, man. It's routine duty. You know what kills preachers? I mean, really wipes them out and puts them in the hospital. It isn't preaching. I've never met a preacher with too big a preaching load. I've been in a place they said, Brother Rupp, would you mind being on our broadcast in the morning uh, at 8 o'clock and then, and, and then I would have a Bible for them in the afternoon? I said, no, I wouldn't mind. This wouldn't be too big a load. No, it wouldn't be too big a load. I like to preach. I like to teach. That's what it's called to do. I don't mind that. I'm in a meeting where we had a radio broadcast at 8, and then I had a morning thing at 10 o'clock, preaching the street at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, even service at night. And then the question and answer when you got through. You said, what about them? nothing? I enjoy doing that. That ain't what wears me out. You know where's a pastor out? It's just going around putting on fires all day long and trying to keep some dictator that's talking about him being a dictator from becoming a dictator. <laughs> And going around trying to keep this family together and that family together. And the Christian just one over here and one over there and stray sheep over here and stray sheep over there. And you forgot to thank so-and-so for the flowers. Forgot to thank so-and-so for the silverware. And you forgot to make the announcements about the something meeting here. And you didn't give credit so-and-so for making the decorations. That's what kills you, boy. What wears you out is just junk, man. It isn't the preaching. You take an evangelistic work. I was a full-time evangelist for 12 years. I've been a full-time evangelist for 12 years and a pastor for over 20. I know what I'm talking about. You know what beats an evangelist crazy? On them planes, off them planes, on them buses, off them buses. In the old days, on the train, back off the train, car breaking down the road. You get sick in the meeting. You get Asiatic flu while you're preaching. You're spitting all over the board. You're lying in the hotel and room all day long, taking out of brain and stuff, and out of brain, but tying all, you know, and that's, uh, 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 that stuff uh, for... Uh, Malaria, uh, what is this stuff? Uh, no, it's real bitter tasting stuff. No, 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 it's stronger now. <laughs> Honey, what is that junk when I get a cold? I, I take it. It isn't bromo quinine. It's quinine. Quinine. You take all that stuff, you're lying around there, you know, all that kind of stuff. You're in a meeting and you get a tooth operated on, you're spitting blood all over the pulpit. You don't have any doctor where you are. You have to go where the doctor is while you're there. And then you lose your suit in the cleaners, and they give you the wrong suit back from the cleaners, and you tear the airport, and the guy's got the, your bag locked up in the trunk, and he forgot the key to the trunk, 
And you run down there, you go, yeah, that happens, man. And you go sail down there and you're late. You go sail down there, you got two minutes to catch the plane. You go sail through over here and you got one bag in this hand, one bag in that hand. You're 50 years old running 35 miles an hour, man. And you get there, they're shooting, and you just, boom, just took off. That's what beats you out. And I, I, I wanted a window seat. Sorry, our window seats are all taken, you know, and that kind of stuff. And they get there, and then you reschedule the meeting. You miss the schedule. You got this guy's schedule, that guy's schedule. You're supposed to be here, and you should be over there. You should have told this guy you cancel over there, and you promised this guy. That's what kills you. Just junk. It's routine stuff. Routine duty kills them. I mean, whether you know it or not, brethren, but you're living in a highly complex age. I mean, look at us sitting here tonight. You realize how unnatural this is? I mean, I'm not talking to you my natural voice. I got a thing on here. That ain't sunlight. That's electricity. We're not outdoors where your parents were, Adam and Eve, in a garden. You're in a building. And you go out there and get in that car, you're breathing carbon monoxide all the way home. It's unnatural. I mean, after a while, it'll just wear you out and just beat you to death. You know me, I'm reactionary. I mean, I'm really reactionary. I'll tell you what, I, born, I, I belong about 1880 or 1870. I don't belong in this generation. I don't even believe in shoes. I believe in bare feet. I don't have any socks on right now. <laughs> I'm a bare feet boy. <laughs> I'll tell you, man, you couldn't make me wear shoes unless I had to wear them. The reason I got them on the night is I have to wear them, you see. If it weren't for that, I wouldn't have any shoes on the night. I'd be in bare feet. And when I get home, get out of that plane, the first thing I do is kick off the old shoes, get out of the backyard, walk around the dirt. You see what makes you like that? I don't know. It just takes all kind to make a world. <laughs> I just, I just, I just, I don't fit. I don't fit. I have never fitted. Somebody said, Ruckman, when are you going to grow up? I said, never, never, absolutely never. I think that's a sin <laughs> to grow up. <laughs> when are you going to change? I'll change at the rapture. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't fit. I don't like the age. The age doesn't like me. I don't belong in it. It doesn't suit me, and I don't suit it. Uh, I'm one of these fellows, you know what I think? I think, I think ice cream is vanilla. That's what I think. You said, don't you like? I said, I didn't like. I said, ice cream is vanilla. You said, what about chocolate? Well, that's frozen desserts, you know, or something like that. But ice cream is vanilla. And candy is chocolate. And if it ain't chocolate, it ain't candy. It's sweets or bonbons or delicatessens or gummy bears or something, but it ain't candy. If it's candy, it's chocolate, you see? And, the th uh, and, and, and people don't know that about me. I'm a plain fella. I'm old, old, not even so complex. So no, I'm just, I'm so plain, I'm funny. That's the problem. <laughs> I'm so plain, I look complex, you see? But I'm just plain. I like just plain food and just plain clothes and just plain people and just plain everything. I don't like nothing fancy. This age just wears me out. Please wait to be seated. Oh, shut your mouth. Get on my way. <laughs> I mean, I go in a place I never wait to be seated. Now, if it, brother takes me out for a meal, I've got to behave myself, you know. But I'll, I'll move to the place before they invite you back there. And I, go, I never wait to be seated. I go in and sit down. If they don't like it, they can lump it. They punish you by not giving you a menu. <laughs> You know, you know something? I was raised in a generation where you waited on people and the customer was always right. Folks talk about service. You're getting less service for your money worth these days than any generation that ever lived. I mean, when I was coming up, you stepped in the elevator, the guy there asked you what floor you want, and get the floor for you and open the door for you and close it. I bet it's been a while since you've seen that. I bet you go to a theater, you don't find an usher there, the flashlight take you to the seat you want to sit, sit in. I mean, they rendered service back in those days. I just, I just, I have no use for the generation at all. Wait to be seated. Why? So they got the little thing all worked out where their waitresses can handle it in perfect order where they, hey man, the place is for my convenience, not for theirs. I am paying the bill. And if I'm paying the bill, I'm going to sit where I want to sit. And if I can't, you don't get the money. <laughs> Oh, Ruckman, you're mean. I'm, I'm not mean. The thing is, you're stupid. That's the problem. <laughs> the thing is, you haven't thought that thing out. You're letting them just work you over and mold you, and they got no business doing it. I've, been, I've gone there and sat down and got the glass of water ready to start, and then the, the lady came by and said, I'm sorry you can't sit there. 
I said, I want to sit by a window. I'm sorry we're not serving this table. I said, okay, get up and leave. Nothing to me. You missed the bill. It's your, it's your problem, not mine. I'm not sure what the money you are. <laughs> I mean, I just, what do you have? What do you want? I like two over light with bacon. I like two over light with uh, bacon and toast and crisp bacon. Can I get you any orange juice? No, I want two over light with toast and bacon and crisp bacon. You like some coffee? <laughs> no, I want two over light with toast and bacon and make the bacon crisp. Is that here to go? <laughs> <laughs> I want two over light. <laughs> I mean, I'll get up after a while and leave, man. And when they bring in the bacon, you can use it for a slingshot, you know, and you wrap it around your finger. I mean, I mean that sucker, that sucker didn't hear a word I said. She just sat there with a little format she was told to ask these questions about. I know what I'm talking about, man. <laughs> oh, <laughs> all that stuff, asking all those questions, they're not listening to what you're saying at all. I go to the airport and go start there, you know, and, and beep goes the button, you know, security, and beep, you know. And I take off my hat with the metal clips in it, beep, you know, and you go through again, take out your keys and put them in. I tell the lady it's my belt buckle. And she's empty your pockets, please. I said it's my belt buckle. I empty my pockets, you know, and then I go through a beep. I said, it's my belt buckle. <laughs> I mean, I know more than she does. <laughs> I mean, I know what I got on, and she'll say, she says, take off your belt, please. I told one of them, I said, you want my pants with it? <laughs> I mean, I mean, I, I resent, I, I resent being out in an airport among strange people, and some strange woman comes up to me and says, take off your belt. <laughs> What, none of your cotton picking business, lady? You got a buzzer there you can put across you, and it bothers on the belt buckle. The problem is the belt buckle, amen? I was going through a, I was going through a, I'll get back to this mess in a minute, but I was, I was going through, I was going through a, the airport the other day, and I saw a fellow about my age suddenly stumble, he tripped on, a, on somebody, one of the hammer these carts, pulling their bags on it. He stumbled and fell down. Right away, there were six people trying to help him up. And I said, let him alone. He's all right. He can make it. And the man smiled at me and nodded at me getting up. He appreciated that. You know, us fellas, we like some sense of self-sufficiency. My daddy used to get, uh, he had uh, diabetes real bad. And sometime out there on the beach when he was up around 70, sometimes he'd just come to the beach and just fall down on the beach. And right away, people rushed to him. He'd cuss him out. He's unsaved. Get away, you blankety blank. I'll get it by myself. <laughs> I'm in a, I'm in a, in a, in an airplane, you know, go on the plane literally this way and I'll, you know, swing with the plane like that. Oh, sir, get your hands off, will you? Okay. I mean, this is the age everybody's trying to be so nice and so sweet and so helpful and so cheerful. I do not appreciate it. Cause it's fake. Have a nice day. <laughs> it's none of your business what kind of a day I have. It's my business. Shut your mouth. <laughs> Amen, brother. I mean, I come into a store. They said, can I help you? No, thank you. Are you looking for something? No, thank you. Just looking around. Anything special? Shut up. <laughs> Shut up. I know what I'm doing. Look here. I'm a full grown man. I got 10 children. I got 10 grandchildren. I've been around, around here for a half a century. I know what I'm doing. If I don't know what I'm doing now, I ain't going to find out in the next 10 years. <laughs> amen, amen, amen. All this stuff. It's that routine duty. That's what killed them. Up here, up north somewhere, I don't know when, but it's right about right around this area, I imagine. I thought I'd get up one morning, get to his car, and, you know, going to work, pulls into a gas station, except fill her up, run there, gets him something, drink water, something, come back out, and says, which way was I going when I came in here? <laughs> and the gas station fell says, that direction. He said, oh, good, then I've had my breakfast. <laughs> I'm getting where you... <laughs> When it gets so bad, you can't tell them have you had your breakfast or not, except for which way you're going. You've got problems. You've got problems. And you people up here in, in Detroit, Michigan, I know why you can't have a real revival and have it sustained. It's, you're, you're just beat. You're beat, man. I'm going to see me drive off these plants in the morning. I've seen them out there in the morning, you know. And then a the big snow comes down. They get jammed. You sit in there five, ten miles an hour. Get the plant running there. You know, sign goes off. And, or, you know, full, 
flaps on a box top for four hours, you know, clap, 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 the intellectual pursuit, you know, twelve dollars an hour, flip, 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 flip. Lunchtime comes, half of half a quarter of beer, half a gallon of beer. You got to flip, 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 flip. Four hours, and you get home there, turn the TV, all hell in Croatia, hell in China, hell in Japan, hell in Western Europe, hell over here. Sit down there and eat a TV dinner, get on line in bed, boom, 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 boom. Why? My God, man, it's no wonder he ain't worth anything. <laughs> I mean, get up in the morning eating bran flakes. <laughs> did you know, did you know that you are what you put into your ears, your mouth, and your eyes? <laughs> And if you put rock music in your ears and pornography in your eyes and bran flakes and toasted, frosted, chocolate bombs in your mouth, you're going to wind up an idiot, man. You can't get it. <laughs> you can't build character with that kind of stuff. And people wonder why this thing is, why he said that why the devil's out to wear out the saints. And modern, modern American civilization is designed for that, brother. It's designed... I try to make a telephone call, I get them on the phone, put in the money, you know. Beep, 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 beep. Fun operator, ATT, thank you for calling. I, don't tell me, thank, I, I'm, whatever I got, I, I dial, I, I didn't think now, who should I call? Oh yes, AT&T, thank you. No, thank you for calling, AT&T. shut your mouth, lady, I got a number here for you. And you know, give them the other number, you know, and then, then click, boop, you can't get it. I shake the thing in the quarter, don't come back, I lost my quarter. And I phoned him again, and I finally get somebody. I said, I want to talk to Dr. Claude Baum in Weissachie Baptist Church in San Antonio, Texas. What's that address, please? Weissachie Baptist Church, San Antonio, Texas. How do you spell that? I said, lady, if I could have spelled it, I'd have written him a letter. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, don't tell me. Don't tell me any outfit that's got $50 million worth of computers and all this modern stuff can't find that address when you ask for it. I don't, I don't believe that. I get these little cards with bills, my water bill, my electricity bill. Please do not fold, staple, or mutilate. I fold them. I fold them. I fold them, mail them back. I say in the future, please the re use the right size envelope for your convenience that matches your, your bill. I mean, I'm paying the money. They owe me the courtesy. I owe them nothing. I owe them the money. And I, when, you, when you pay a man for a job, he's supposed to deliver the goods. Amen? Well, some of you are pretty small on that, aren't you, huh? You got this thing. You know what? You, you somehow you picked up a peculiar philosophy. And it isn't European either. You picked up a philosophy that whatever goes wrong is somebody else's fault. And they've got to pay you for the trouble that you cause. The funny kind of philosophy. All right, routine duty. You know what that'll do? It'll kill you dead. It'll kill you dead. It'll finish you off. The, the, the modern, modern civilization is too high power and too high strung and too tense. Folks always talk about tension, 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 you know, and how to cope with your tensions. Well, there's a lot of truth in the thing, but the answer is not psychology and amateur psychology. The answer is the Word of God and prayer and not trying to serve God in the flesh. And even then, you're going to have to devise ways and means, you know, to survive with a thing, even with that. Routine duty. That's what kills them. Just doing day by day the things you ought to do. Bob Jones used to say the best preparation for tomorrow is to do what you ought to do today. You know what a kid doesn't like to do? He doesn't like to do his homework. You know what kills the young fella? Just happen to do day by day what ought to be done. That's the drag. That's the drag. That's what killed them. All right, now I've, I've showed you the problem. And the problem is the devil's going to wear out the saints. And he wears out the saints by temptation. And he wears them out by persecution. And he wears them out with gloomy forebodings about the future. And above all, he wears them out with a line of routine duty. He's waiting up there to spring on you when you show up. Now the, the next thing that comes up is a positive thing. And the next thing is what is the solution for these things? Well, my text has the solution. If you still have your Bible open there before, you look at the solution in the text. And the text says, Consider him. Consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be weary and faint in your mind. The solution is considering Jesus Christ. 
And I think that's the greatest verse in the Bible because it not only tells a Christian how to keep from getting worn out, it tells the sinner how to get saved. If you're here tonight, you're unsaved, salvation is so close to you, you wouldn't believe it. All you have to do is consider Him. If I could just get your mind on Him for a few minutes, you'd get saved. That's the problem. What think ye of Christ? The Holy Spirit's going to come in, and when He comes, He's going to convict the world of sin, Christ says. Why? Because they believe not on me. And I want to have you consider one or two things before we close here tonight. And first of all, you need to consider this. Consider who it was that endured such contradiction of sinners against Himself. Who was it? It wasn't just an ordinary man. It wasn't a fellow like you or like me. If it had been us, there wouldn't have been any contradiction. Whatever we get, we deserve. And even though we feel sorry for ourselves at times and claim we don't deserve it, we all have a little that streak in us. Still, we're sinners. What we get, we deserve, including death. But you take that one there that endured such contradiction, know who that was? That was the one there that uh, lay out there on the ground at night when he looked up there in heaven and looked at all those stars up there in the vault of the oriental midnight. That, those stars up there were just, they were nothing but the diamond band wherewith he clasped the robes of his glory. And that one walked up down this earth and they said, you see those stars? He said, I'll drop them down like an untimely fig tree cast over figs. They said, you see that moon up there? He said, I'll turn it to blood. They see that sun? He said, I'll darken it. They you see that earth down there? He said, I'll crack it open. They see that ocean out there, that storm out there? He said, peace be still. That's the one. That's the one. That's the one that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. And you're to consider him, lest ye be wearied and faint in your mind. Consider who it was that endured such contradiction. Now let me ask you this. Do you know what kind of contradiction he endured? Well, read it. He walked up and down this earth, and they treated him like a renegade anarchist for all the days of his life. They said, we be not born of fornication like you. We're not bastards like you are. That's what they told him. We got God for our father. We got a father, and you haven't got any father. You're born out of wedlock. That's what they said to him. They treated him like a renegade anarchist all his life, and he walked up and down this earth, and the sun smote him, and the rain chilled him, and the cold chilled him, and the had no place to lay his head and lay out there on the ground at night like a fox in a burrow or a bird that has a nest, not even that good. And he went through that and went through that, and then finally he sat on a chair and they whipped him, they spit in his face and called him Beelzebub and called him a devil and made fun of him and slandered his father and slandered him and attacked his disciples. Consider, consider what a contradiction of sinners against himself, what he put up with. And let me say this, consider how he, he endured it. How did he put up with the contradiction? Or consider it this way, how do you, when somebody crosses you like that? Oh, they won't say that to me and get the way of me. I'll tell you, boy, I'll show them. Well, they better have not called me that, you know. I'll fix them, you know. That's us. And this one, he was slapped in the face and reviled and spit upon. You know what the book says. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again but committed himself to him that judges righteously, who bore our own sins in his body on the cross, that we being dead to sin might live unto righteousness, by whose stripes we're healed. So we come to this point. Why did he endure such a contradiction of sinners against himself? Why? He did it for you. I talked with a missionary one time, been over in Africa about uh, 25 years. You know, he told me, he said, Brother Ruckman, he said, I hear you're pretty good answering Bible questions. He said, I thought I was pretty good too. The one time I had a convert I talked to. And he said, uh, this convert, he said, he finally got saved. But he said, for years and years, I could get nowhere with him. And every time I saw him, he asked me the same question. And I said, I must confess, even after he was saved, I couldn't fully answer the question. I said, what was the question? And he said, every time I deal with this fellow about getting saved, he'd say, well, there's something I don't understand. He said, what's that? He said, you keep telling me God loves me. He said, yes, God loves you. God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. And he said, well, then, uh, why did He love me? And so I tried to explain about Christ loving sinners and a friend in public sinners, but he said, yeah, but why did God love me? And I tried to tell him about something about election and God's choice, and he said, but, but what is there in me that God would love? Why would God love me? And he said, I never could tell that fellow. Well, I don't know if I could tell you. Let me say, well, it's a marvel, you know, a fellow that he could be a friend of somebody like Judas Iscariot. I'll tell you a greater marvel than that, how he could be a friend of somebody like me. You say, explain that. I can't explain it. It's a contradiction. That's why the Bible says, consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. 
you take uh, you take Jesus Christ if he were here alive a day, and I speak reverently, and he's on his way to the cross, which he no longer is. But if he was on the way to the cross and came to this room here tonight, I'd say, well, how about coming up here a minute? He'd come up here and I'd say, I've got some sins I need to get taken care of. Can you take care of my sins? He'd say, put them on me, I can handle them. I'd take all my sins and dump on his back and I'd say, can you take any more? He said, I'll take the sins of the whole congregation. I'd take all your sins and lay them on his back. That'd be some pile of sin, wouldn't it? I'd say, can you take any more? I can take all of Detroit. I take all this in the Detroit and put them on his back and I say, you can't take it anymore, can you? He said, yeah, give me the whole state, Michigan. You know what that book says? That book says he died for sinners and he so loved the world. He goes, behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Can you imagine taking all the sin in this world and putting them on his back? I say, can you stand anymore? He said, I can take the whole load. I can take the devil's sin and the angel's sin and put it on my back and he turn around and walk out that door and go out that door and cast them behind his back in the midst of the sea and that'd be the end of them. You say, why'd he do it? He did it for you. If I get you to consider that, I think it would save you from a lot of fainting and falling by the wayside. But the problem is it's hard to get folks to consider that stuff and get their mind on it. It's hard for them to take a hold of it. Consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest he be wearied and faint in your mind. You have not, not yet striven, not striven to the shedding of blood in resisting sin. The times now have washed out the footprints of the stranger of Galilee's shore. And the voice that once soothed the rough billows will be heard in Judea no more. Yet the path of the lone Galilean with joy I may walk in today. And the toil of the road will seem nothing when I get to the end of the way. And the toil of the road will seem nothing when I get to the end of the way. There are so many hills to climb upward, I sometimes am longing for rest. But he who appointed my pathway knows just what is needful and best. I know in his book it is written that my strength shall be as my day and the toil of the road will seem nothing when I get to the end of the way. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Father, we ask Thee tonight for the assistance and the power of the Holy Spirit in doing the work we can't do and undertaking for us where we cannot undertake for ourselves. And Lord, we pray for some Christian here tonight about to quit, about to quit. You'll get them back on, on the beam like we saw out in the world and back on the track and back on the finish in the race and finish their course with faith like Paul did and not, not drop out here. Help them by Your grace. Maybe some young person going through some fiery trial they don't understand and can't handle. Help them. Father, we pray. Maybe some older saint here with some real suffering and real physical problems and the devil working their mind. God knows what. You know what's in this audience that I don't know. But I know people. And I know there's sorrow and suffering. And I know that there's somebody here tonight probably going through temptation that would have knocked me out of the ministry years and years ago if it had been sent my way. And I thank God you've been as merciful to me as you had, Lord. And if you've done anything with me, thy gentleness hath made me great. And if it hadn't been your gentleness, I'd have never got anywhere. Now, Lord, help tonight these people. And, Lord, be, be gentle with some of them. And lead them like a shepherd. And protect them, Father. Give them the strength they need to go on in the race for thee. Let's remain the head bowed and eyes closed. Light time for our musicians to play for us a few minutes. Now, maybe there's a Christian here tonight. And as they say out in the world, you're about to throw in the towel and quit. 
And it's no time to quit. It's time to go on and finish the course. I ask God for grace and strength. And if there's some trial that's on you, you don't understand, ask God to give you wisdom and show you what it is. Help you understand it. And if he don't help you understand it, give him, ask him for grace to take it until you do understand it. And if you're here tonight and you're unsaved, you know what to do. Consider him. We'll tire just a couple of minutes here in prayer. And I want you just for a few minutes to think about what Jesus Christ did according to that book to get you home to glory and did it for you and got nothing from it but heartache and suffering. The most completely selfless act ever performed this earth and get your mind on it. I've been mistreated, Brother Rockman. Yeah, but nobody's pulled out your beard yet and spit on you yet. Maybe some of you. I've been in congregation where it's happened, but not most of you. Nobody slapped you yet, whipped you, and taken everything you had. God help you. Father, help your people. Give them strength and stamina and stick to it and some character to go on reading the Bibles and go on tithing, go on witness and keep on attending the church and stay in their routine visitation and routine prayer meeting and routine Sunday school. All these dry, dull, tedious things that wear us out, Father. Give us the strength to perform them cheerfully and joyfully and show us the meaning of them and maybe put thee first and yeah, ask for the strength that you can give us to get us through them cheerfully and the power of the Holy Spirit. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Listen, I'm about through. I've said about all I can say. Um, you won't let the devil whip you. You won't let him whip you. Don't do it without a fight. Don't without a fight. Paul said, I fought a good fight. That's the Christian life. I know that military figure doesn't mean much in modern Christianity today, but it's gotten me through many a time. Many a time. You know, some of my favorite characters out in the world are unsaved, unsaved men and women. Some of them are gangsters. Some are Nazis. It is not that they're my brothers and sisters in Christ. It's that I see in them character, 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 character to finish what they start. And when I see it sometime, I'm ashamed of some of my brethren in Christ. You ever see Jake LaMotta? Jake LaMotta, they call him the Raging Bull. He was an Italian boxer. When he get boxed, he go crazy. He didn't stop me, kill a guy, just to kill him. Just beat him to stuffings. And finally one day he got his, he fought Sugar Ray Robinson. And Sugar Ray Robinson knocked him every way but loose, knocked loose every tooth in his head, boy. Black both eyes, busted his nose, busted his jaw. When that fight was all over, Jake LaMotta slid along the ropes to Sugar Ray's corner like this, face just all torn to pieces, and said, you never knock me down, Sugar. You never knock me down. <laughs> That's good for you. I mean, you hardly talk, man. Just torn to pieces. But you never knock me down. <laughs> hey. I need some of that. Right. And if he knocks you down, get back up. <laughs> <laughs>